Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back. It is playoff time. We finally made it through what Cody, I'm convinced, is the longest regular season. That was the longest regular season in sports history. That regular season, I think, took nine or ten years. No one will be able to convince me otherwise. It was, it was, is that a bad thing? Were, were you unhappy with the regular season? It was season? too long for me. Yeah, okay. it was too long. I don't know if I was unhappy or if it's bad. It just it felt like it went on forever, and I feel like we've been in this position. Because the thing is, you could have just like flipped a coin or done what they did on Sunday, which was super fun, where everyone figured out what the seeds were going to be, 15 seeds in the final day of the season. They could have done that a month ago. What, what's, the, what's the difference? What did we learn? Nothing happened in the last month. We could have just done that exam, the same uh, roulette experiment. It would have been fantastic. And now I'm very excited for the, for the postseason. We have, to t- we have to talk about everything, and we have to boldly declare who's going to win the championship at the end of the show. Yes. I think the thing was is there was some excitement with the Rockets a couple of weeks ago, and I was kind of Houston, on that. I was the like, Houston Rockets? Yeah. I was like, this is interesting. Maybe How did they're we gonna, do this? How did we start the this show race? with a non-playoff team? Okay. Spe- yeah. Oh, speaking of a non, <laughs> yes. before we start here, Ben, I, I just want to say I'm heartbroken now that Victor Wembanyama is out of our lives mm. for the next few months because yes. watching him mm-hmm. as a bat, like this, this is the kind of juice that I needed injected into my basketball veins, and it, it was just an incredible ride to watch him. And I'm very sad that we don't get to see him against higher level competition, surrounded with his own better teammates and whatever else. So I'm hoping that in the next few years, we see the rise in playoff ascension of Victor Wembanyama. Uh, but for now, that was uh, he was he was my number one favorite watch on the season. So wow. that that got me through it. I'm excited for the playoffs now, though. Wow. Well, yeah. uh, we, we have to get to the show because there are so many things that I'm excited about that I'm I'm I need answers for. And we have a limited amount of time, so we just have to start getting through them. First of all, this is a weird show to do on Monday of this week because I think for the first time ever, the playoff, the play-in game results really kind of mess with my head about how the bracket's going to shake out in both conferences. It's not to say there hasn't been exciting play-in teams. I mean, obviously the Lakers and the Heat both last year made very deep playoff runs from the play-in position. But, you know, like, what happens with Philadelphia and Miami? Philadelphia and Miami are playing. Is it going to be Celtics-Boston? Is Philly going to play Boston? Is Philly going to get to Milwaukee? We just had a video uh, today on the Thinking Basketball YouTube channel about Joel Embiid. I want to talk about Philadelphia. There's a ton of stuff I'm interested in with Embiid and with that team and Nick Nurse in the playoffs, whatever happens. Um, Then you have the zombie heat. Then in the West, you have... The Lakers and the Pelicans in in one game. You have the Kings and the Warriors lurking in another game. There's some interesting matchup things that I want to get to there. I have questions about some of the top teams that I'm really excited to see. The Oklahoma City Thunder. I have a ton of questions about them. I have questions about teams that as I go through this, I can't even remember the questions that I have. We're going to get to them later in the show, but that's where my head is at. We can start wherever you want. Pick a conference, but man... There are so many things that I'm excited, like so many questions I'm excited to get answered just in the first round or two of the playoffs before we even get to the whole thing that most people care about, which is like, who's going to win the championship? Who's going to be in the finals? Let's start with that first play in game in the East, because I, I actually haven't watched Embiid since he came back, right? I, I haven't seen, no, I haven't, I've watched a game of it. I haven't. Wow. Part of me, here's the thing. Part of me felt like I was like, am I actually going to learn anything from this? Is he going to be so like getting himself back into shape? that by the time that the playoffs come and the play-in come, it's going to be a different player. So I'm going to punt to you right now, and I'm going to, I'm going to learn along with everyone. Have you watched Embiid since he returned, and what are, what are your thoughts, and what do you think the implications are going into the playoffs? Yeah, you're, I think you're going to like this video. I wish you had seen okay. it when we could just get like a raw reaction live mm-hmm. on the show. Yep. Um, the conditioning is the thing that has to come up to speed. Mm-hmm. And... Whether a guy of his size and his history with conditioning can do that in a short period of time, I don't know. But everything else, uh, he looks great in the basketball sense. Just looks great in terms of playing at his own speed, his his feel. Uh, it, I almost wonder if he worked on certain reads or passing. Or One of the things that I really noticed doing this video and looking at his film from 2018 through 2020 24 his tempo and cadence with the ball is a lot more deliberate he's going slower 
but it's more effective, if that makes sense. And that also applies to his reads. I think this is the best passing season. It is the best passing season. Why am I being wishy-washy? This is the best passing season he's ever had. The offense is totally different. The team has added Buddy Heald. Uh, Embiid has had great synergy with players like J.J. Redick. And remember a couple years ago, Seth Curry, Mm -hmm. two-man game shooting. And I'm not saying Buddy Heald is that kind of player exactly, but... These kind of like movement shooters, that high level shooting. That's really interesting to see how that gets added into some of these lineups next to Embiid and Maxi, all the handoff action, the two man game. So I have a lot of questions for them, including Buddy Heald. What's he look like in the playoffs? Buddy Heald's never played a playoff game. I went to look up Buddy Heald's playoff three point percentage because sometimes with these guys, there's a lot extra happening in the postseason where your your percentages are going to take a ding. Teams are going to play you differently, but maybe more importantly for shooters, you're going to be taxed on the other end of the court. You're going to be taxed defensively. Your legs go out. So there's a ton of questions there. And to and to get to really where you're going, Cody, I think Philadelphia, let's start the show with a fun declaration. I mm-hmm. think Philadelphia is easily the most likely team to challenge Boston to win the Eastern Conference. Oh, wow. Okay. So you still like in the shape that Embiid is in with some of these questions still swirling, you still want to put your foot down. And I, okay, let me ask you something. Is your declaration right now based on the uh, concern about Giannis's health right now? Or would you have said the same thing two weeks ago with a healthy Giannis going into the playoffs? Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I am not that high on the Bucks, So we'll get, we'll get to that. We can, we can get to that. <laughs> yeah. We can get so, that. so it's like, If Philadelphia were to, let's say, split the play-in games, they now they've played Miami very well. So I think just for a single game series, I give them a decent chance. But it's also Miami. It's Eric Spolstra. It's the heat. You don't know what's gonna happen. Like the calendar has turned over. The 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 switch has been flipped. Here we go. Will they get eliminated and peter out in the first round? Will it be one of those Miami Heat playoff series? This is another question. Like, will will it be yet another year? Where the Heat are just like, eh, they're not there once we get to the end of April here. They're just not really on the radar. They're done. Or will it be another year where the Heat are doing their thing and you're like, yeah, Jimmy Butler, Bam on a bio, Eric Spolstra. Who's the latest role player? Nikola Jovic. Look out for him. He's mm-hmm. an interesting guy. Like, I don't know. I don't know. But it starts with that play-in game because I think uh, Philadelphia. I would, I would make Philadelphia – a favorite over New York if they were to meet mm. in the first round. Okay. And New York has a lot of questions with injuries. Go ahead, Cody. What do you think? So this this first play-in game, I think, I'm looking at all of the play-in teams, and I wonder how Miami's going to be able to attack and beat. Because I feel like any coach going into the series, especially in the state that Embiid is in, is like, all right, we're going to try to tax this guy as much as possible. But the thing is, is the main guy that Embiid's probably going to be defending, Bam Adebayo, is just not a consistent, consistent outside threat. Like he's shooting like 34% from long mid range, which I think he's usually like a mid 30% long mid range guy. It seems like he's dabbling with taking threes a little bit more recently, but it's definitely not anything you're too concerned about. But the way that they can use him to really try and tax Embiid, because we know that Embiid likes to go into the drop defensive coverage, is just spamming the bam at the top DHO kind of handoff actions, right? Getting some of these guys moving, uh, getting Tyler Hero, getting downhill for that pull up mid range game, getting that pull up three point game. Uh, you know, like you said, Nikola Jovic is he's playing well, he's shooting well. Butler, though, I'm not really sure. I haven't seen the engine revving like I feel like I saw a little bit going into the playoffs last season. So I'm not sure if we're going to see like a, a, a performance that's going to inspire you to make another is Jimmy Butler a secret genius kind of guy. Like I just haven't seen evidence that we're going to see that kind of thing. And to me, that gives me the most pause about Miami. But like you said, Spolstra, bam, we know that he, his ability to run that kind of an offense. I, I could see this play in game kind of being a coin flip right now. A coin flip. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna say a coin flip. Yeah. I don't want to lean one way or the other. Well, it's interesting because last year you did have some premonitions about the Heat and Butler. You were on record with that heading into mm. the playoffs that you talked about. This year we haven't quite seen seen that same level of play. Maybe you haven't seen anything that catches your eye. And I think the one thing in the back of my head is Jimmy Butler is very quietly almost thirty five years old. 
Like mm-hmm. he's he's a little past 34 and a half years old. And maybe you're just starting to slow down at that point when you're a big physical athletic player like he is. Maybe that's what's happening. And so we still get a little playoff gear, but it's not that much. But again, normally when we do this preview on Monday, the who the seven and who the eight is doesn't make that big of a difference because you're more interested in the one and the two seed. And in mm-hmm. this case... I mean, I'm not going to say I'd make Philly a favorite next week over Boston. I think that series looks a lot different in a month, which is why this is so interesting. Because the other thing about the 7-8 game right now is it puts you on the opposite side of the bracket, right? So Mm -hmm. if you're Philadelphia and you win that game, not only do you play the Knicks, but you jump to the opposite side of the bracket. So you're not going to play the Celtics potentially for like a month, right? You're not going to play them until the Eastern Conference. And so that might change some things in terms of the team, the conditioning, what they've been able to figure out on the fly. You know, this goes back to the Nick Nurse questions. Uh, Scouting Embiid and going back through the old tape for this video, 2019, second round, playoff series, classic, Philadelphia-Toronto. Who's the coach on the other side? Having Marc Gasol play him a certain way, having the coverages tilt toward Embiid and defending Philadelphia in a certain way. It's a Nick Nurse, of course. He's Mm -hmm. the mad scientist over there. So... We're going to get a Nick Nurse, uh, Eric Spolstra play-in game, but then potentially we might get on the fly, you know, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks of Nurse and these guys sort of figuring things out in the playoffs. And it's not the greatest roster in the world, but I kind of think Philadelphia has a a, a low-key, very nice roster between uh, Nico Batum and Tyrese Maxey and Embiid and some of the other players that they have. So I, I don't want to dwell forever on this play-in game, but I think I want to backtrack a little bit what I was saying. I'm not making the the claim that the Miami Heat are equal in the playoffs to the 76ers because I think once they get rolling, I think in a seven-game series, I would pretty handily pick the 76ers over the Heat. But it's the one-game aspect of it. Like I feel like that's almost where the Heat are the most dangerous. Like if we were playing like an NCAA type. Uh, bracket 64 teams I'd be more scared of the heat going into that so I think that's where I'm sitting right now with uh, their matchup against uh, against the 76ers you said something a little bit earlier I want to get to and that is that if the 76ers go against the Knicks you're probably going to pick the 76ers what is your thought process in that one well let's just acknowledge also that New York has a bunch of like now Ananobi played right um but they've had some injuries where guys are going in and out of the lineups. I really like the Knicks. I think if I had to power rank the East, I think I would have the Knicks third. And you've got uh, Jalen Brunson, our friend, our old friend, the little engine that could. Okay. You've got um, OG Ananobi. Bogdanovich starting to get integrated as an offensive piece that they might need. And then all the other athletes and rebounders and the Josh Hart's and uh, Dante DiVincenzo, by <laughs> Cody Dante DiVincenzo, in the season finale, in a game where New York had to win so they could possibly play Philadelphia for some fascinating reason, he played like fifty three minutes in the game. He played, I think, he played <laughs> almost all of but thirty seconds in the game. I was like, this is the most Tibbs thing I've ever seen. So, th- I think the short answer from a basketball perspective, with all that said, is the Knicks' offensive firepower in the playoffs is still something that is a little bit of a question mark for me when getting to the higher levels. And I think Philadelphia represents one of those higher levels. Can we pause the show for a second and and have a sidebar conversation, Ben, do you want to, do you want to have this conversation about the Knicks going all out and winning in that game on Sunday? Oh, because you, because you liked it and I didn't like it. Is that what you, yeah, it was sick. Know. I'm so pro the Knicks doing what they're doing. And I want to hear your, like, why do you not want the Knicks to go out and win that game? Well, they can avoid Philadelphia. I think it's a bad, I think Indiana is objectively a better matchup than Miami or Philadelphia for New okay. York. Yes. Okay. Do you think the Knicks are a title contender right now? I do not, no. Okay. You don't think, so you, you, do you think, think that they're a title contender? No, I don't. Okay. But so if they're not going to win the championship anyway, 
Like, you might as well go out with the story. Because the whole point of, like, playing a good basketball season, going into the playoffs, it's all about the narrative. It's building that story about yourself, right? Jalen Brunson crying after a huge victory in the regular season. The Knicks just going all... Dante DiVincenzo playing 50 minutes in the last game of the season. Wasn't it 53? Ben... My point is, is if you're going to go down anyway, if you're not going to win the championship, you paint that story as well as possible. And when I grew up, I was, I was a goalkeeper when I was playing soccer, right? And my, I was always taught, if you know that there's no chance that you're going to stop that ball from going in, you make the most spectacular dive ever because people are going to remember that attempt. And I think the Knicks, I, this is what sport and basketball is all about. Go out there and win. What I don't want happening? any of this strategic losing nonsense. I love the Knicks. They've gone up 100 points of whatever, like, whose line is it anyway kind of made up points because of the all. But I just love the Knicks. I'm picking them if they go against the 76ers. Knicks in five over Philadelphia. Knicks, Knicks in, in five. five. Knicks in five, man. Knicks in five. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. I'm not even hesitating. Knicks in five. They they deserve it after yesterday. Um, I think I stuck this somewhere in this latest video. You know who had the best offense in the NBA this year, Cody? Was it uh, the Nuggets? It was not the Nuggets. It was oh. not the Nuggets, yes. The Celtics? Best, the Celtics had the best okay. offense in the NBA. The Celtics offense was almost eight points better than league average. They had a, oh 100 and, they had a 123 offensive rating this season. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my question to you is, <laughs> what, what is Philadelphia's offense this season when Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid play? You said the, the Celtics are 123 on the season? Mm-hmm. Wait, when they play or when they're on the court together? No, in the games. When because Embiid is, and Maxi have missed a lot of games. They've I think they've played like thirty six games together. In those thirty six games, what is Philadelphia Philadelphia's offensive rating? I'm gonna say hundred and twenty one. Hundred and twenty two. Okay. Is the answer. Yes. You're still sticking with Knicks and five? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Listen, here here's my thought process on this. I my big question for the Knicks going into it is just how much is Jalen Ball going to go? Like, how far can they be carried by the workhorse that is Jalen Brunson? It seems like he's up for the task. Like, this is a guy that's going to, like, hospitalize himself just attacking every single possession. It's going to be great, right? Not that I'm pro hospitalization, but again, the story, like... The full Del 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 to the hot. Like, yeah. yeah, that's sick, right? Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't mind seeing Brunson doing that kind of thing. And the Knicks are just filled with guys like that. They're big... They're physical. Like, that's what Embiid is. He's a big physical guy. And I think the Knicks are one of the teams that are like, okay, we're going to match you pound for pound, strength for strength, right? They have some feisty little point of attack guys that they can send to, to Maxi. I don't know if anyone can consistently stay in front of him. Like, some of those matchups when, when OG was the primary defender on Maxi. Like, I thought Maxi got by him fairly consistently. It's just not OG's strength to take guys like that. But I think in terms of, like, being strong and being big in the post – and then, you know, being able to spread the floor, guys are shooting the ball well, the cohesiveness lately. Um, I think all of that combined with just, I'm a little nervous about Embiid for sure and his health. Uh, the Knicks are going to attack that with 50 minutes a game of all of their guys. And I just think that's going to be overwhelming for this Philadelphia team. Well, I, I will say the one time they played in the regular season, it caught my eye as a tricky matchup for Philadelphia. And I think the Knicks won that game by a lot yeah they won that game by 36 in philly Mm. yeah i think i only watched the first half would have to go back and check my notes but it is an interesting matchup in terms of the style making the fight um but yes so you are so new york on record let's go to the let's go to another series okay Okay. before we come back to any of this other stuff with some of these teams in the east the three six series between Indiana and Milwaukee. Yeah. Why are you smiling? So, 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 you're so smiley. Listen, sure, I'm biased. I'm a Bucks fan. It, this are is you, the, this are you is sure the draw. you're a Bucks fan? I was told by people that you hated the Bucks. I hate Giannis. I can't stand the way that's a lie. I love Giannis. This is, this is the ideal pick for a Bucks team that's struggling. Like, this is the team. Like, I, I don't know. The Pacers, I, if we played this earlier in the season, and, like, if we took the first half Pacers and they were playing the Bucks right now, I'd probably pick the Pacers to win the series. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what we've seen, I mean, some of the offensive rating stuff with, with Halliburton, I think first half of the season pre-hamstring injury, like, 126 offensive rating was on the court like insane types of numbers but since he's come back and started playing like 30 minutes a game uh their offensive ratings actually been like half a point better when he's on the bench than when he's on the court 
like really strange stuff with him. Uh, it's, you know, clearly documented with the three point shot kind of being there, uh, not being there. I don't really know how he's gelling with uh, Siakam. I think Siakam brings a really interesting, like sort of attack that the Pacers didn't have. It's not exactly like the super high octane sort of attack that the the Pacers were doing prior when when Halliburton was healthy. But I don't know the health of Halliburton. The offense isn't exactly what it looked like early in the season. I just think this is a team that's going to struggle. Um, it's going to struggle in the playoffs. Yeah, I'm with you. I think if this was the first half pre injury Pacers Tyrese Halliburton, this would be a pretty fascinating matchup between these two teams. Going back to the games earlier in the year where Indiana consistently gave them problems and knocked them out of the in-season tournament uh, semifinal in Las Vegas. So it's a little different now, and I think it's the best, maybe the best possible matchup the Bucks could have settled into. I guess my big question is, do we know that Giannis is playing at the beginning of the series? Has that been revealed? Has the type, the sort of the degree of his calf strain been publicly revealed? This, we, we're not the news podcast. We don't know this kind of stuff. <laughs> All I know is the last time there was a huge injury near the playoffs for Giannis is when his knee looked yeah. like it went the wrong way. And then in he just came back and he's like, "I got it, no problem." Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Giannis might be a super, like a superhero coming back. Uh, I'm assuming going into the series that Giannis is going to be there and is going to play moderately well. And if that's the case, I'm picking the Bucks pretty handily. If Giannis is not playing, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm that low on the Pacers, but I don't know. Are, are we sure that the Pacers are even winning, easily winning a series if Giannis doesn't come back? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I, I would not. I would not pick Indiana in a landslide uh, no. if Giannis doesn't come back. And certainly, if Giannis misses like the first half of the series, it's the kind of thing that you could see at a two-two. Um, it would, you know, for Indiana to feel really good about that, you'd want to be three-one in that situation. Uh, I have more questions about that situation because we can get into. Milwaukee and the new coaching and what's going on there and, and what is it you know is there something symptomatic if they have another bumpy early playoff series is that just it for this cast and it needs to be reshuffled maybe the questions are bigger about Dame Lillard maybe it's just his age I'll put a pin in that okay because I know I know I know we're gonna put a, we're gonna put a stopwatch on so we don't get stuck Cody's favorite series Cody could talk about this series for like two hours straight without oh losing any steam. And I want to talk about it for like two minutes max because I have bigger questions. Two minutes. <laughs> Orlando and Cleveland. Um, you can give me your thoughts on the series. I just kind of... The way we do this is we don't go through every series and micromanage every... It's like, I just want to know, either of these teams, do you think they could win the next series? That's my question. Like if they made it to the... Well, one of, the, them, is, one of them is going to win the series. Yeah. So either yes. of these teams, do you feel comfortable <laughs> saying one of these teams can win the next series? Okay, so they're in the side of the bracket with the South. With well, the Celtics, okay, all right, right? yes. I with guess the, it gets the Boston Celtics. I guess it gets a little trickier. They're on the Celtics side. In theory, what? In theory, Cody, just just to play the probabilities, okay, just to play the odds. What happens if they were to play another team in the second round? Mm. It would either be like a Miami or Philadelphia, probably. Could they win another series? I think they could make it interesting. I think this is an interesting enough year where um, may I think the Magic have a lot of question marks going into this. I mean, both teams, these two might be like the two teams with the most question marks going into the playoffs. The Cavaliers just because, what, they're like 13 and 18 in their last 31. Since, like, since everyone just, like, came back. Yeah. Yeah. Since everyone's healthy and out there, you like watch them. Like there, There's a play, I think it's against the Lakers recently, like Donovan Mitchell is a sideline out of bounds play, throws a cross court, Evan Mobley's in the corner. And Mitchell's like standing, like pointing, like pointing vigorously over here. And I can't tell what he wants. I, I He either wants Evan Mobley to go into a, to a dribble handoff with Darius Garland, or he wants Garland to get this flare screen from, uh, flare screen from Jared Allen. None of those things happen. And instead, those three just kind of stand there, and Evan Mobley's like, all right, ISO time. And you see, like, Mitchell, like, visibly be like, what is actually happening right now? Mm. And I feel like that's a microcosm of how they're doing is there's just, there's absolutely no gelling. Like, if you try and track, I think that would be an interesting thing is tracking these kinds of teams and seeing how often, like, the star players synergize on offense. It would not be a high percentage on here. It's a lot of my turn, your turn. It's a lot of Mobley and Allen are kind of operating the same space. Um I don't know. It's just a team that feels like they're vulnerable to attack, which is the perfect place for a Magic team who, when you watch them, you're like, can this team score more 
than 80 points in a playoff game. <laughs> but then on the inverse, can teams score more than 75 points against them in a playoff game? So I think there's it has questions and then defense. And all of that makes for a really fascinating... I mean, this is this is one of my like gold star... I'm going to be locked into this series. This is the NBA TV series. It's also the Cody special. Mm-hmm. The Magic, I... I loved that game against the Bucks the other day. Giannis did not play yesterday's game, Sunday, mm-hmm. season finale. All the marbles on the line in terms of seeding. And the Magic came out, and they looked jittery, and they looked nervous, and they looked like a young team on the big stage. They couldn't throw it in the ocean. And the Bucks took a 10-point lead, and then all of a sudden, Orlando got a little comfortable. They dialed the defense way up. Jonathan Isaac is starting now. Everyone stand back and hold on to your – put your tray tables in an upright position. We are taking off. And I I sent a message to the Thinking Basketball team. I said, uh-oh, the Bucs are in huge trouble because <laughs> they, like, couldn't get the ball across half court. They couldn't set up offensive possessions. Do you know how many Jalen Suggses and Jonathan Isaacs were on the court? I don't know how many. I didn't know you were allowed to clone people and put them on the court. They were everywhere. Uh, and then over the course of like the next seven minutes, Milwaukee scored three points on a three-shot free throw from Dame Lillard. That's the fascinating thing about Orlando in a playoff setting. On one hand, they look like a genuinely elite playoff team. They have the personnel. They have the versatility. They have the energy. It's going to be fun and exciting. On the other hand... They look like arguably the worst offensive team in the of the 20 teams in the tournament. Pa- we've talked about Paolo being overburdened in this role. He did a good enough job uh, yesterday in that particular game, as he's done in many games this year, to just get them above water. But how much is that going to hold up in the playoffs? How much do they need other guys like Franz Wagner, even Suggs? Isaac is shooting more. They just need to get more shooting, more offense. Teams are going to dare them to shoot threes depending on the lineups and the personnel and situation. The offense is clunky as heck at times. So it's a it's a kind of a weird math series. And then I think I take that and go forward. And uh, you can put me on the spot later if you want me to make a pick in that series. But I just don't think either of those teams can win another series. Let me, let me ask you like a theoretical thing here. Is there a better team in the NBA for guarding the the Mitchell and Garland duo like is there a better defensive lineup than what the Magic are able to roll out I, I don't maybe, know maybe the Celtics maybe the Celtics uh, yeah I don't know the the combination that was so crazy against the Bucks and so maybe this applies to Mitchell I don't know how much it applies to Garland but maybe in a secondary sense it applies to Garland um Suggs on the ball and actually, they move Suggs to Chris Middleton because he's bigger and more versatile. So you stick some hawk on the ball, like Gary Harris. You just put someone on the ball. And then when Isaac is involved in the pick and rolls, it's like the combination of a good guard defender and Jonathan Isaac and pick and roll. Um, yeah, I don't... Maybe it's ideal. I don't even know if you need to be ideal. I don't know what's going on with Cleveland's <laughs> offense. I don't know what's going on with that team. It's a weird series, but I don't... I think we should move on because I don't think either of those teams is ready to win the next series. Are we making picks or are we, should we save? Well, some, we can some, we can talk. If action. you want to put me on the spot, we like to talk about percentages and things like that. We can do that later. I got to sort this out. I'm sorting this out okay. for the first time live on this show right now. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll save it. Let's go to another series then. Uh, I think that's all the series, right? We have to now think. We have that's to do- every series? Thank you for listening to another episode of Thinking Basketball. That's uh, the playoff preview. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, are we uh, going to the West now? No, I, we, I need to finish up oh, my Celtics. thoughts. Oh, Celtics. Yes, we haven't Sorry. talked about Boston. <laughs> I need to finish up Do my we? thoughts in the East. Oh, you just think it's a, you think it's what? A fait accompli? Is that what they like to call it? Yes. It's done. Yes, it is. You, you, you have the Celtics penciled in, or did you take pen and write them in the NBA Finals? I mean, if, you know, I'm not going to phrase it that way. I think there's a good chance that the Celtics are like, what? They they lose one game before the finals? Maybe lose two games before the finals? That's where I'm sitting. Well, the yes, Celtics because right they're, you mean the conference finals or the finals? The finals. No, see, this is where I disagree a little bit. I disagree okay. a little bit. I think, I think these teams are great. I think the Celtics are great. We're going to talk about Denver. I think they're great. But I actually think the teams are a little bit more competitive than we give them credit for. 
based on how weird the standings have got with like eight teams just tanking it in. You know, like eight teams are like, eh, we don't really need wins in the second half of the season. And it's created this space in the standings where like the 10th seed in the West has 47 wins. And if you look at last year, like the second seed had 49 wins or whatever it was. Um, And the Celtics are great, as I said. But I just feel like saying these teams aren't vulnerable. I mean, Boston, I have questions about their bench and their depth. We've talked about their sort of offensive process at the end end of games. Well, we haven't talked about it too much, but everyone else has talked about it. I think there's something there in terms of the style of attack. There's something there in terms of where would you rank Boston's best offensive player in the hierarchy of offensive players? It's certainly not the top five. Mm-mm. Is it even the so, top 10? Is Jason Tatum a top 10 offensive player? Yeah. I mean, th- this is the kind of thing when you get into a playoff series, if a team, if a defense can kind of take some of your stuff away in the half court, or maybe they take away your transition defense to offense and they force you to play in the half court and the game tightens up and you have possessions that are, are tense and need to be simplified and things like that. You know, are you expecting to get really good playoff offense running a lot through Jason Tatum or whoever else it would be? I mean, I think the average person wants to say Jalen Brown is next, but as we've talked about before this season, Derek White does a lot of stuff in that, situation. I mean, I don't want to be overly reductive because their offense is a little more dynamic than that. But my point is that I am not ready to think like 12 and 0 or 12 and 1 is something that we should just put in pen in the Eastern Conference. Look at the rest of the Eastern Conference teams though, okay? If you think about how good of a playoff offense they can generate, what other team in the East can generate a better offense? Philadelphia is probably my only answer. Yeah. yeah, I think that's it. I can't, because sure, the Celtics offense, you could be like, yep, that might be the the weakness point that you point to. And you're like, maybe they'll have some struggles there. But no one else is doing it better, right? Like, if they meet up with the Magic at the second round, are you going to trust the Magic's offense over the Celtics? <laughs> Definitely not, right? Like the Celtics are making their bones on defense, okay? They are just covered with defensive players. And I know what you're talking about in terms of, uh, in terms of the bench guys, but their main five guys are going to be playing quite a bit together. Al Horford seems to like to pick it up and play 30 minutes a game in the playoffs. I know he's one of the, the 37, 36-year-olds, so we'll see how that ends up going for him. Um, but I don't know, man. Like the defense ratcheting up, it feels like the defense gets even more valuable in the playoffs. I'm not sure how much more physical they can allow it after the second half of the season, like, are we just going to see a continuation of the regular season? Is it going to feel a little bit different going into the playoffs? Uh, regardless, it's the style of basketball that I think the Celtics are going to be uh, excelling at. Okay. Do we have anything else to say about the East? Um, no. Let's let's move to the West. We can circle back to this if we need to. Let's move to the West, where we have a similar uh, kind of situation brewing right now which is in the play-in game. The Lakers play the Pelicans. We don't know who's going to win this game. I actually think it's a really weird thing where the Lakers just went down to play the Pelicans, won that game yesterday on Sunday, can just stay in New Orleans, and as the road team play the Pelicans in the 7-8 play-in game, it's very hard to beat a team on their home court twice in a row within you know a couple-day span. This was basically a redux of the in-season tournament game when the Lakers punked the Pelicans. They basically did it again. LeBron James doing like his little old man Magic Johnson impression and like 11 assists in the first quarter or something flying down the court. He gets all compact. He's like, I'm not a vertical player. I don't jump very high. Uh, yeah. And this the reason why this is such a big thing for me is because I think the matchup with the Lakers and the Thunder is fundamentally different than the one seed Thunder matching up with any of those other three teams. What do you mean by that? The matchup with the Lakers is fundamentally different problem than any of the other teams. They have Anthony Davis. They have LeBron James. They're a giant team. Anthony Davis can do things to people that shouldn't maybe be televised all the time in basketball games. And I think that is a very, very tricky matchup for the Thunder. I will also add, if we want to get very meta, I mean, I think the Lakers are one of the best teams in the West. They just happen to be in the 7-8 play-in position because the standings are really close and lineup changes at the beginning of the year and Darvin Hamisms and I don't know what's going on there. But I do think right now what we've seen in the last few months, the Lakers are one of the best teams in that conference. And so, again, 
if they end up losing the game and then winning the second game and then playing OKC, that might throw off my calculus for how mm-hmm. I see the rest of the bracket shaking out. I'll say the Lakers have been really snappy. Like that's the best way I can describe the way they're playing basketball. It feels like the ball movement's really good. It feels like now that LeBron's moving past this, hey, I'm a top five offense because of my Helio sort of thing. He's moved past it, but now he's like, look at how good of a secondary passer I am. Uh, I trust guys like Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell to make some of these patches, passes. Anthony Davis diving to the rim is just one of the scariest things to see around. And of course, Anthony Davis on defense. I think he's already like man can this dude play some basketball he's so good at disrupting everything in the paint with his uh, deflecting shots blocking shots it doesn't matter he's everywhere down there but based on what you're saying here ben do you see a possible world where the lakers play spoiler to either oklahoma city or denver yeah absolutely you don't think so (laughs) oh man i mean you know epistemologically do i see a possible oh, world no. sure oh, no. it can happen epistemologically ladies and gentlemen but, but <laughs> i i i wouldn't i don't know i think no matter which of those two they draw i'm probably gonna pick either the thunder or the nuggets at like five or six. Oh wow okay yeah well we I have a, this is fun hopefully this is fun for the audience because we have a lot of uh divergence in how we're seeing some of these things I have. We want to get to the Thunder. I don't want to spend the whole show on the Thunder because I could spend the whole show on the Thunder. But I do think, based on the matchups that I've seen and based on their track record in playoff settings, the Lakers can beat the Thunder in a playoff series. You could see, I could see the Lakers winning that series in like six games. Would I say the same thing about the Lakers Nuggets rematch? Nah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, it's more like I would. T- I would think the Nuggets are going to be in that. If I'm trying to do percentages in my head, the Nuggets are more in that like 80%, like really nice, comfortable range to win the series. They could win it in five. They could win it in six. It's not the greatest matchup. But the the Lake, Lakers-Thunder matchup, I think is a scary matchup for the Thunder. I think it's a good matchup for the Lakers, considering where they are in the bracket. So, yeah, um, I think it's a big deal in that sense. And then you get to the second round, which would be the winner of the Clippers and the Mavs. And uh, again, I, I don't I don't know why the Lakers wouldn't be competitive in that series. Certainly, the Thunder could be competitive in that series. So the whole thing is resting on this silly playing game on Tuesday night before I can make sense of any of this. Yeah, so we can't even talk about why. Okay, just we really can. brief him. We can give yeah. me th- thirty seconds, maybe a minute, maybe ten minutes. We'll see what happens. Uh, why do you think Oklahoma City is a little bit more susceptible to to the Lakers? The size. What it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you have the size, you have the versatility, um, they're very big defensively, and then what what you're trying to do... So let's jump into the Thunder, okay? Um, I have like more questions and more things I'm excited to see in a playoff setting about the Thunder than maybe any single team in the tournament this year, maybe any single team in the last five to ten tournaments. Because we have Shea Gildas-Alexander as a primary. I want to get to that in a second. We have, we have Jalen Williams doing Jalen Williamsy things. We have Chet Holmgren, and we have all the role players and, and Mark Dagnall as a coach, who I think has been a splendid coach in the regular season. And now we get to see, okay, what does he have for adjustments and that kind of on-the-fly game planning and flexibility and counters? Because say what you will about Darvin Ham and the Lakers, but at least their staff has shown some bendiness and willingness to change things up with coverages in different playoff settings. And that's where you say, okay, what are you going to do to take away the thunder in a playoff setting? Where do you start? I think you start with choking off Shea Gilgis Alexander, right? I think you start with saying, Shea, we've, we've done video work on this. His, the way they set up the space for him to score in isolation and the way he can score in the mid-range by creating some of that space, that's where they generate a ton of stuff in the half court. And even in transition, coming down in semi-transition, delayed transition, they get the same things going. If you can shrink the court and find a way to take that away, if you can disrupt some of those actions, if you can say, hey, Lou Dort and Josh Giddy, you're actually going to have to take 33s in this game, and that starts to work, now it gets really interesting because Oklahoma City gets a ton from their defense on the offensive end. They turn you over a ton, get out in transition and semi-transition, get those cross matches, get that space 
that they create. And that's where a lot of their success comes from. So in games where OKC's defensive length and activity is turning you over and they get to use their quickness from defense to offense, you are in big, big trouble no matter what team you are in the association, like period, full stop. Okay, their record against top eight teams in the league this year, 25 and 13, second best only to the Celtics, who were 29 and 13. So you don't want to get in that game with OKC because they can beat anyone. But if you don't turn it over as much, and this is where LeBron ball might come into play, right? Like, okay, let's contain our turnovers. Let's slow them down. Let's figure out how to not get disrupted by their length on that end. And on the other end, we give you a bunch of length. We give you Anthony Davis, and maybe we have the right scheme or guys to kind of contain Shea. I have a ton of questions about how that's going to work, what what adjustments the Thunder are going to have, what Jalen and Chet can do playing off that. Um, I'll stop there. It's just fascinating to me. No, I think there's some interesting stuff. And in terms of LeBron, I wonder how much he can dial it up defensively because I feel like watching him a lot throughout the season, he's definitely, I don't know, there's a lot of the twitchier stuff that he used to do a lot more that's just not happening as much. He's still got the incredible hands. He still has the court mapping and stuff like that. At what level can he bring himself defensively? And then I think, like you said, there can be some really interesting defensive stuff going on. Do they play it like like they played the Nuggets last year? Obviously to not great success getting swept, but is somebody like LeBron going to be on Chet? Is somebody like Rui going to be on Chet so you can keep Anthony Davis kind of near the paint as much as possible to try and funnel people people into there uh i do think there's a lot of flexibility that can go on there but i think oklahoma city is also quite flexible they have a lot of rangy wings that they can throw at guys right and anthony davis isn't the kind of big man that you're just gonna like oh i have a mismatch so i'm gonna throw you down and let you just you know pound it into the basket he can do that once in a while but i don't think you're gonna win off a steady diet of anthony davis like mismatch post-ups so i think he does I, do I that know. a lot i think he does do that last thing you think you think that's good In, enough to no but for i think them to, I think okay. in the playoffs, it messes things up because if, you're, if you get the wrong cross matches, LeBron will just start feeding him. He'll get, eight, he'll get 16 free throws a game. Twitter will melt down about why the Lakers are mysteriously <laughs> shooting free throws. The team that doesn't shoot threes, that plays bully ball, and why are they shooting free throws? Um, it's, okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Uh, on that for a quick second, I haven't dived into that discourse too much, but they, people seem to compare it to drives. They're like, look at how how little drives the Lakers have and the fact that they have so many free throws. Yeah, because post-ups exists and cuts exist and <laughs> things like, like, it's not just drives. Like, let's relax for a second. Come on. Let's be oh, better. Let's be better, better. Okay, so did you have more about what you were saying there? I'm sorry, I jumped in. Uh, no. No. No, what, what did I even say? I said, oh, yeah, the flexibility of OKC. So, yeah, I, I, oh, I I'm a little bit more skeptical of that Anthony Davis is going to carry the offense with, with mismatch post-up type. Well, I, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to carry the offense, but he does this weird thing where he starts making jumpers in playoff settings at, at no other That's time. Fair. He was doing it on Sunday. He just came out and had like 15 points in the first quarter or something. But also, we've talked about this before. We talked about it on the Finkies. I think there are subtle things happening with Anthony Davis in a playoff setting that makes him so versatile. That's why I voted for him for most versatile defender. Chet Holmgren, who is great, gets a ton of mileage attacking closeouts against slow-footed big centers who have to deal with his spacing stretched out to the three-point line, running toward him, and then turning and recovering as he dribbles at them on a closeout. And there's just probably no one better amongst the like traditional rim protector centers than Giannis. Well, I guess... Uh, uh, Wemby exists, but then Anthony Davis. Yeah, there's that Victor Wemby. Not Wemby's. playoff basketball. Yeah, sorry. Wemby doesn't exist there. Sorry, Cody. We won't see him for a few months. But that, So these are the kinds of things that I think can be specific to a matchup where it happened last year in Memphis. You turn on game one in Memphis and you watch the first quarter and you're like, oh, how's Memphis <laughs> going to win the series? Because Memphis's plan A and plan B went right out the window. There's no plan A and plan B that works in that matchup last year for Memphis. So they just have to slog through the rest of the series with plan B, uh, with plan C effectively on offense. And then on defense, this gets back to why I jumped in on you. Like, yeah, I think, I think in a playoff setting, the games where Davis goes for 40 points because of all those mismatches at the rim and the offensive rebounds and the cross matches, I think they add up. It doesn't have to be the greatest offense in the world. It just has to be good enough. 
Yeah, I guess there's always the question. Donovan Mitchell's there. It's like, are we going to see the apotheosis of, of Anthony Davis and oh, Donovan are Mitchell? Big words. Are they just, just going to rise up and become godlike? And I think that that completely changes. Like, the Cavaliers could win their series. Could Donovan Mitchell go as to, like, I don't know, one of the most efficient playoff scorers ever? Anthony Davis could start hitting his jump shots. I don't want to make this a Lakers hour, but the Nuggets, are you a little bit more skeptical of that that matchup? No, no, no. no. We'll, we'll get to that in a second because I think what's interesting here is – if the if the Lakers win the game and have to play the Nuggets, I could see it being a short playoff run for the Lakers. On the flip side, based on that outcome, the Thunder then get the Pelicans. I think that's a great matchup for the Thunder. So I think it's going to be tough for New Orleans, as talented as New Orleans is, to do everything we just talked about in that matchup. Take them away, prevent... like. The Lakers are a veteran team. They're a big team. They can try to slow things down and say, hey, we're going to be a little more simplified in how we attack. Austin Reeves pick and roll with Davis. LeBron James pick and roll with Davis. We're going to be a little more simplified. That can potentially take away turnovers and things like that. The Pelicans are a different kind of team. It's a little more up and down. It's a little more inconsistent. They're a younger team. Even in that game, on Sunday, you could see the Lakers right in the first quarter. There's just a number of plays where it's like, oh, LeBron or AD, this, the basketball IQ is coming. That, that play was nothing more than 10, 10 to 15, in LeBron's case, 20 years of experience, understanding the angle, understand the coverage, just get something easy out of it. That's a totally different team in, in New Orleans in terms of that matchup for the, for the Thunder. So I would look at that and go, okay, now the Thunder can go through. Assuming they play the Pelicans. I mean, technically, they could play the Kings or the Warriors. I'd say the same thing, right? It's not the same thing as the Lakers. The Thunder would get a preferable matchup. Then the Thunder would be sitting there in the second round against the Clippers-Mavs. And Cody, now I think it's time, the part of the show, to discuss Clippers-Mavs, part three. Do we have wrestling music that we can play? Like, <laughs> what's this going to look like? This is series number two just stamped. Like, I appointment viewing... Really fascinated to see what we're doing. We have the surging maps who, since the trade, things seem to be gelling. Things are great. Clippers seem to be on the downward trend after going through a, a period of time, maybe looking like the best team in the league for a while. It's like James Harden shows up like, oh, they're terrible. We lose five straight or whatever it is. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, James Harden bought in. Look at how incredible this team is. And now it's like, oh, do they seem to care anymore? So there's a lot of competing thoughts for both of them. The thing with the Mavericks that makes me interested going in is if you look at like, you know, they've been surging, right? And I think if you look at the the on-court net rating when both Kyrie and Luka are on the court, and I'm not looking at hey, yesterday, I don't even know if they played yesterday, but if you look at uh, the last 18 games or something like that, on-court offensive rating, sorry, on-court net rating is like plus 14, right? It's like plus 13.8 or something like that. That's, a, that's incredible. Like going into a playoffs, that's what you want to see from your two best players. But all of those teams they've played, Ben, out of their last like 19, they've only played like, four healthy eighth seed or better teams and it's not like they were blowing those teams away so I think they're riding high and kind of bottom, bottom feeding like you said there's a lot of teams that just weren't very good this season and I think they were beating a lot of them pretty handily right and so maybe that's juicing exactly how good they are going into the playoffs but I also don't want to take away just like I think they're an interesting big flexible team and Luka Doncic is maybe the most or second most unsolvable offensive player in the league right now and Kyrie Irving seems to really be growing into the the secondary role again like he was with uh, LeBron in 2016 so I'm not sure I, I want to see what you have to say here before I jump in with any kinds of predictions well the biggest thing is the once again deja vu the question mark and health of Kawhi Leonard that's where mm. it starts with me so I think he's missed eight games to close the season my understanding, and we won't do medical hour. I know Co Cody likes to do gym hour uh, as someone myself with a little bit of a, a meniscus missing on my right knee. I can like relate to some of this, but Kawhi has had the ACL. He's had the meniscus. It's that same knee, and they're calling it inflammation in the knee. Um, that doesn't sound great to me. So it's like one of those things where... It's Kawhi Leonard, and in 2019, he like dragged his leg around for the second half of the playoffs, and he was plenty fantastic. Uh, I do think his best series was probably the Philadelphia series. I got to rewatch some of that last week. He just looked great. And then at some point in the Milwaukee series, I think he, he banged his knee hard 
where he landed on his knee hard and he was just kind of dragging it around. The point is, he could still come back and play at a very high level, managing whatever is going on with that knee. Maybe it's some kind of chronic inflammation, um, you know, giving him pain or limiting his movement or something that they just have to manage for safety and precautionary reasons. I could see him coming back and playing. I could see him possibly even missing a playoff game or two and having a run. Or we get to the series, which is less than a week away, and they're just like, no, we can't. Kawhi Leonard can't play. And now we're off. And it's like, well, when can Kawhi Leonard play? Um, Because if he can't play in game one, that's a really, that's a really, like in a short period of time, like one day to two day rest, that's like 100% extra time, right? Mm -hmm. But when you've been out for like three weeks, an extra like two or four days is like 10% more time it's very unlikely that we're going to get to game one and they're like no no Kawhi in game one but he'll be fine for game two through seven so I I don't know I don't know if he plays I I feel like I like the Clippers we can talk about why if he doesn't play I feel like I like the Mavs and it's for obvious reasons I just don't know if the Clippers have enough firepower to contend with I mean you you got a, a nice high floor I think with Luka on the other side offensively. So you just have to contain defensively. It could be a competitive series, but I, I pick the, I would pick the Mavs lean Mavs the other way. I think regardless, like Kawhi's out, Kawhi's in, I'm probably leaning Mavericks in this series. Okay. T- and t- tell me why. I think my, my theory on this is you watch how the Mavericks are playing right now. They're a huge team bet. They're a huge team. Having Luka Doncic out there is effectively being your point guard means that you have Kyrie Irving, playing the point guard position, and then everyone else is just massive. P.J. Washington, he's like 6'7", right? It seems like he's like 6'10", when you watch him play. He has a 7'3", wingspan, man. That's why P.J. Washington is just everywhere. Daniel Gafford, just out there to swat all the shots, like, ever. Like, big dude. Derek Lively is second, right? Josh Green, not getting as many minutes lately, but Josh Green's out there, another big guy. I think when you look at the size that the Clippers have sort of uh, the theory of the way that they're able to beat you is like, look at how strong we are. We can get to our spots. Of course, we can drive to the basket and we have speed, but we're just big dudes and you're not going to be able to throw size at us. But I think the Mavericks can throw a lot of size at them. I think they're sort of built for this kind of Clippers matchup. I think a team that would be really tough for the Mav- uh, for the Mavericks would be a team that has like, like the Cavaliers, like I was talking about earlier. That's the kind of team where Mitchell and Garland I think it would be tough to stay in front of them a lot more with the size and the kinds of defenders the Mavericks have. But for the the plotting, I'm going to kind of dribble around and get to my spot kinds of guys that Kawhi ha- uh, that like Kawhi is. I think the Mavericks are better for that. And I, I don't know. All of that together, I think it's going to be a very close series if Kawhi is healthy, but I still lean Mavericks. Here. So where's your – when you talk about this mismatch advantage or the size, is your brain thinking when the Clippers have the ball or when the Mavs have the ball? When the Clippers have the ball. When the Clippers right? have when, the When ball. the Clippers have the ball, I think the Mavericks are able to throw out the kinds of big, rangy defenders to kind of nullify the size that uh, the the Clippers are bringing, like, from their wings. Hmm. Do you just you disagree with that? Yeah, I don't know how much I love um, this sort of... I, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. In that it maybe is a better type of matchup for the defensive personnel that the Mavs specifically have. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, I think the Clippers are just a high floor playoff offense with their absurd tough shot making. And then you start to get into stuff about, to me, this series really is on the other end. Uh, how many how many possessions is the Los Angeles offense starting off of Dallas make? Because when you do that, it's harder to score against a set defense than when you get a live ball stop or a turnover. My intrigue with this series is the Clippers have just been doing some weird, funky stuff defensively this year. Their matchups in transition are a little atypical for NBA teams. They'll basically just match up with the nearest guy. So the center will guard the point guard if that's who's nearby. And then they can do this because they fall back into a lot of like hyper-switching, hybrid zone kind of defenses and concepts they have possessions throughout the year where we're looking at the tape and we're like is that a zone I don't know if it's a, is it a zone that then turns into a man based on a trigger 
where the ball goes. There's all kinds of like fun stuff going on. And that gets me to the next part of the series, which I think Ty Lu has a big coaching advantage here because mm-hmm. Ty Lu has demonstrated over and over that he's very good at tactical matchup manipulation in these playoff series. And this is why I say like, if you get Kawhi out there, and, and we talked about Paul George in the defensive episode. Paul George is also still a nice offensive player. Um, Russell Westbrook has is very close to the full veteran reinvention coming off the bench with a little more defensive pizzazz, getting pace in transition, and also adding a little rim pressure off the bench with those second unit lineups for a team that doesn't have that. I think the totality of that, uh, to me, makes me comfortable picking the Clippers and it goes both ways. Like you can talk about for Dallas, this might be a good defensive personnel matchup, but I don't know how much that chips away at the Clippers offense. Um, it's almost like you're saying you expect the Clippers offense to falter or be a negative offense in this series. And I just, I have a hard time seeing it. Well, I don't necessarily think that. I think both teams are coming in with some pretty high level offense because, you know, you're talking about that there's a high floor for the Clippers. I feel the same way about the Mavericks, right? Like you have Luka Doncic out there, your offense is going to be pretty unsolvable, right? Especially when you have Kyrie coming off the uh, whatever side he's getting the ball. And I think there are some of those possessions where Kyrie kind of gets into his like, I'm going to be running around Jamal Murray type of thing. Uh, Because of my movement, I'm going to get open here, extra passing sort of thing, boom, bang, somebody gets a wide open three, right? And I think the jitteriness of Kyrie is also going to be really tough for the Clippers, who they don't really strike me as a team that's going to be able to really shut down like one of these quick slashing types of point guards. Like they don't have the personnel defensively there. And I don't want to make it a like who's stopping Kyrie kind of conversation. But I do think that factors into it a little bit in terms of, you know, how close this series is. Both teams are coming out with some really high level offensive players. And I think maybe at the end of the day, I just trust the high level offensive play of, of Luka Doncic over what the Clippers are going to specifically bring. And I just trust the the roles that the guys next to him, the big guys next to him are going to be able to play. Not that like P.J. Washington is moving the needle that much defensively, but like Rui for the Lakers, I think he's interesting enough defensively that you can do some stuff. Well, that's why I was asking you about which side of the ball, because now it sounds like you're saying it's really the it's really when the Mavs have the ball that's the secret sauce. Right. Well, the secret the, the secret sauce for me is the Clippers when they have the ball, right? Because I do think the Mavericks' size allows them to match up with the Clippers well, but I also think that the Mavericks have an advantage on the offensive side. But I just think the defensive side is is the interesting part of it for me from the Mavericks. Well, it's 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 one of these series that and that's why I was asking about which side of the ball because if 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 Luca Ball is very successful, if he goes zoo hunting, and I think the Clippers are going to have better ways of protecting him than what we've seen in the past. Uh, but let's assume for the sake of argument that it is very successful. Then for the Clippers to win the series, they would need to also have a juiced up offensive series. And that's where you're saying that you like the Mavs defensive matchup and thus that leads to your your conclusion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm glad we talked through it this way. It's making me feel better. But I don't know if Kawhi's going to play, but it's making me feel better that if Kawhi plays, I, I lean Clippers. Well, remember, if the Mavericks win, that just means my analysis was right, yours is wrong, and you just need to uh, pack it in, Ben. That's, that's exactly what, what we get. That's, that's it how means. it works in the playoffs. No, it's not. It means I'm totally biased, and that's why I was wrong. <laughs> um, I want to stay. I want to do the exact same thing we did in the East right here because of this just wild and crazy tournament and what's going on. And it might lead to more questions, Cody. uh, Can either one of these teams win the next series? Wait, you're saying the Clippers are Mavericks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I definitely think they can. Yes. So do you want to talk about that? Kind of. I mean, you you think the Mavs are going to win this series, so... Do you like the next matchup for the Mavs? So what would it be? The Mavericks well, we don't know. play. We don't, because of the they, playing game. So <laughs> we they don't know play, what it's going to be. Well, that's the Thunder side of it, right? So mm-hmm. they, they might end up playing the Thunder. Um, that's tough. I think it's going to be... I mean, I would pick the Thunder in that matchup if it ended up being Thunder Mavericks, right? If we're going to get ahead of ourselves here. I don't want to put the cart too far ahead of the horse. I need to see how these, how these teams are going to be playing, but... You know, if you're going to force me to pick right now, I still think the Thunder have a better shot over the Mavericks. But I, I, you know, I think there's always an interesting Luka and Kyrie are on an absolute heater. 
like I said before, Luca has like a top 20 all time offensive playoffs. And who knows, maybe they end up in the conference finals. You know, crazier things have happened in the playoffs. It's just when I'm comparing it to the East, there's just a much better chance of that happening than, you know, the Cavaliers and the Magic making it to the conference finals. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, I think Luca played two of the games in the regular season against the Thunder and they split. So it's, I, I, I kind of like the Thunder in that matchup as well. Yeah. 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 Yes, but the Clippers Thunder would be, well, that would be an interesting series. I think we should save all of that. We're really speculating here. Like it could be, could be Mavericks Lakers, for all we know. What's left? Have, we've we've covered weeks. everything. What's left? Denver's Timberwolves Suns. The oh, Lakers. oh, wow! Timberwolves Suns. Timberwolves Suns. That and is, we haven't talked about the Nuggets, but whatever. that is a fun series. Timberwolves versus Suns. I'm going to go 64% probability that the Timberwolves win that series. Okay. So you are still leaning Timberwolves, even though the Suns... Still leaning Timberwolves. What Have we ever discussed this before? This is the first time I even realized these teams are playing each other. Even though the Suns have won all three matchups this season, quite handily, might I add, with Anthony Davis struggling quite a bit. Anthony Davis? Da- what does Anthony six- Davis have to do with this? Who, who, who did I say? You said Anthony who did I say? Davis. Anthony Edwards, the the Top Gun guy, he has not scored very well against the the Phoenix Suns. Um, it's been some weird number things. Like Bradley Beal shot like six for six from three yesterday. Uh, Booker and Durant, like I think maybe they had one good game against the the Timberwolves. I'm not taking much away from the regular season stuff right now. I don't know how well Cat's going to be integrated back in. I'm always sketched out when a player like Brandon Ingram for the Pelicans. I'm always nervous when a player comes back right before the playoffs start, because I'm interested to see how that changes some things. But I do, like, ultimately, uh, I think this is actually the the series I'm most on on the fence for. Most on the fence? I I, want to lean Timberwolves. Well, the first time they played was in November, so we had less physical basketball back in November. And then didn't they play, like, twice in the last week or so? They did play twice. Was that recent? Yeah, it was very recent. It was very recent. Wow. I think they just played uh, yesterday, and and Phoenix ran away with it in the first quarter. I didn't see any of the first quarter of that game. The Timberwolves, they played everybody. Carl Anthony Towns is back. Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards had just a bunch of turnovers in that game. But I think this is one of those series where home court, size, physicality, getting upped a little bit, I just, I just feel like there's a, I feel like there's enough. Is there? Does Phoenix have a particular matchup edge? Is that what you're saying? That they've won these three games over the course of the year, and somehow it is unleashed. Grayson Allen, it's the Kraken is out. Somehow, since speaking like a minute ago, I flipped. I think I got the Timberwolves pretty handily winning this series. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm, I'm beguiled buy this this matchup thing from the from the regular season. I can't be doing that, right? It's like when the when the Brooklyn Nets beat the Miami Heat in like 2014 four times or something like that in the regular season. I don't remember which season it was, but uh, that didn't really seem to mean anything. I I don't know. I just think in terms of the Suns, I just don't see how they're going to be able to consistently defend. Uh, I know that the Timberwolves don't have like a strong offense, but like Anthony Davis is going to... I I did it again. (laughs) Anthony Edwards. Anthony Edwards is going to get into the paint whenever he wants. Uh, I know that the mid-range assassins of Kevin Durant and Devin Booker like, is the drop defense of Rudy Gobert going to be able to affect that? Like, does that nullify him a little bit more? I think that's maybe a big question going into the series, is how effective defensively does Rudy Gobert make them with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, just wanting to pull up from 17 every possession? Well, that's the the classic, like, fire and ice. Is there something about the Suns mid-ranging over and over again against Rudy Gobert's drop? I think Minnesota has enough flexibility and enough defensive talent around Gobert that unlike when he was in Utah, you can't just be like, ah, Rudy's not going to guard everyone. This is the weak spot. They have to do this. I think they can bring him up higher to the level of the screen. I think they can change certain coverages. I think they can pre-switch behind the play if they need to to keep him out of the play. I think there's going to be more stuff going on in a playoff setting. And I kind of trust the talent depth that the Timberwolves have in a series. Now, Bradley Beal had some crazy game the other day. It was one of his best games of the season. I think his best game of the season might have been against the Wizards. 
when he when he rematched against his old old team when he went to Washington. Forty three points. For Forty three mm-hmm. points in thirty one minutes when he went to Washington on sixteen of twenty one shooting that in that count. game. His second Taking highest out. scoring game in the entire season was yesterday against the Timberwolves in the aforementioned game. He was six for six from downtown, thirty six points, five assists, one turnover in thirty seven minutes. So if you look at that, I think the totality of the evidence from the regular season, if you knew nothing else about these teams or about NBA basketball these days, you would just go like, okay, yeah, Phoenix should be the pick. But I have not seen, maybe I need to watch these particular games. Like I have not seen something that says this series matchup will unlock Bradley Beal. And by unlocking Bradley Beal, that alleviates Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. And now the theory of Phoenix is working because these three guys are doing all the heavy lifting and the bull bulls of the world can come in fine. I'm going, I'm cutting in the opposite direction. I just feel like in a playoff setting, when you get to hone in, you'll be able to challenge some of the passing weaknesses with Phoenix that we've talked about. I think they have a talent depth advantage over Phoenix. I think some of that size will play in. And it may be even home court if it comes down to it. You're beguiled. I'm, I'm saying at the end of the day, if there's a possible seventh game, it's going to be in Minnesota. Cody, give the people of Minnesota what they want. Give the people of Minnesota <laughs> what they want. What did I say? Yeah. 64% Timberwolves. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. I think, I think we're pretty aligned with that. I think I'm picking the Timberwolves. Oh, too right. bad. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have talked you into that. That was unfortunate. Yeah. Should have talked to me. We should have just made the pick and left. Do you want to talk about the Nuggets at all? Yes, that's what I was saying. I think we need to size up at this point. It's time. We've gone through this. And unless you have anything to say about Sacramento or Golden State, I think it's time to say, who are, who are your championship contenders? Who are the teams that when you now see most of the bracket, you're feeling like you have an idea of you're going to see in the third and fourth round, the NBA finals. What does that look like for you? Who are those upper crust teams? We know it's the Celtics because you think they're going to go undefeated. It, going into the finals, mm-hmm. yeah. going into the finals, watch as they drop game one. Like, that's just going to happen. I'm going to look like a fool. Um, who's an actual title contender? We get into the semantics of what an actual title. I mean, it, right in the center of it, you know, we have the Celtics and we have the Nuggets. Um, wow. I don't think any, Ever, no one else in the you? East. No one else in the East. Okay. Is that's an what, inner I, I disagree there. Yeah. Whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Are you that high in Philadelphia? I am. Yep. No way. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I don't know what to say to you. I didn't think that. Like, is Embiid looking that good? Is that what you're thinking? Have you seen him play basketball this year? I mean, this year, not in the last week. Well, he's just like kind of out of shape. That's it. Okay. That's pretty important. I mean... <laughs> Being in good shape, I think, is is pretty significant for a guy that's carrying 280 pounds and has to play for the next two months. Yeah, well, he can play himself into shape. Okay. That works for Shaq when he, like, starts doing it at the beginning of the season. I don't know. I'm more skeptical. But they're, they are inner circle for you, huh? They are inner circle for me, correct. Good. good Meaning, you, huh? meet, are, we, are we defining inner circle as a team that I can see winning this tournament without some kind of, like, one in a thousand fluke situation? Yes. Yes. Then they, yes, they, they are. This is what I was saying earlier. There's a little too much presumptuousness. Presumptuousness. Is that right? It sounded funny when it came out. Presumptivity. Presumptuous. <laughs> Pres- <laughs> There's a presumptivityness about <laughs> just like, oh, the Celtics are going to win and the Nuggets are going to win. So yes, in the East, those two teams. What about the West? OKC. I'm doing it. I'm saying OKC is. OKC's in. Yeah, I think OKC is in. Okay, I can't. I I'm going out with OKC. Can I say something weird? And you're going to call me a <laughs> Wait, hypocrite? Did you hear what I said? <laughs> what did you, did you just say? You said OKC is out. Okay, yes. what's happening? Why are you out on OKC? What's going on? Okay, talk to me. I'm a little nervous about this. I've seen a little too much Shea Gildas Alexander passing and decision making film in the last month. Yeah, why, why are you having this reaction? <laughs> this is such a big moment. So I, this is based on SGA. Well, well, there's a lot going on there. I think this is a great team, but here's what I've decided. Four chances to expose that. I think defenses will have four chances to expose that. I think at some point, someone's going to be able to find a scheme 
that exposes that. That's that's my theory. Yeah. Okay. So it's hard for me to to as much as I love OKC, as high as I am as OKC, as good as I think OKC is, as I I could see OKC in the finals. It's just one of those things where it's like every team that plays them gets more information than the than the team before had, and I feel like somebody's got to come up with something because as great as Shea Gildas Alexander has been this season, it looks like he's going to finish second in MVP, deservedly so. Out of the top end offensive players, he may be one of the most sort of inexperienced in terms of um, making the right read when certain defensive pressures or coverages shift toward him. And we haven't even seen him under the full, get the full playoff treatment in a seven game series from a really good coach yet where t- teams can just dial in on your tendencies. That was another thing when I looked at his isolation possessions over and over until my eyeballs bled earlier this year. Like, he's amazing, but he has some very specific tendencies. And it's I, part of me, Cody, if the bra- bracket shaped up differently, I was going to be like, whoa, what does the Minnesota OKC matchup look like if Minnesota puts his cousin, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, who's a great on-ball defender, on him because he seems to be dialed into these tendencies. And sometimes when they match up in possessions, he can really sit on the certain patterns that he likes to use. So my big theory on OKC is with enough question marks, I just kind of think like, okay, they could make the finals, but somebody at some point is, has to exploit that. The, the teams are too smart and they're too good. It's the, it's the same thing we've seen happen with Embiid. Like, as, in, as great as Embiid is, you get to the playoffs, teams just start throwing a ton of double teams and coverages at them, and if that's a weakness, it's going to come out. It's going to be exposed. And yet you think that Embiid has shed a lot of that that would put Philadelphia Well, I made a whole a, video a about this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I should go, should I go pause the podcast? Yeah, we'll pause the podcast right? and we'll come back and we'll act like nothing's <laughs> happened and then we can get your updated <laughs> thoughts. Um, in the West, do you have anyone else? Denver. Do you have any anyone outside of Denver? Denver? Yes, I do. I do. I think the Clippers, if okay. they are healthy, okay. could win four playoff series. Yes. Here's my weird take about the Clippers. I picked the Mavericks over the Clippers in the first round. Mm-hmm. You're also putting them in the inner circle? No, but I think the Clippers have a better chance of winning the championship than the Mavericks. Okay, so it sounds like you are... This is great. This is a great place to end the show. It sounds like you are diverging with me and lining up with the rest of the national media, and you are, mm-hmm. Celtic, you are a Celtics Nuggets truther all the way. Like, no, I have OKC. I have OKC in my Oh, OKC, circle. I forgot. Yes. Yeah, so you, if so you it's OKC teams. Boston, then I wouldn't be that surprised. Okay, okay. But if there's anyone else in the West that makes it, and if anyone else in the East makes it, I would be genuinely shocked. This is the best. Okay. This what is- rank, rank, power rank your teams in likelihood of upsetting the Denver Nuggets in the Western Conference? In upsetting? Okay. But it, does, it has to be teams that could actually play them, right? Well, I the whole, technically the whole conference could play, could play them. Play them. They, yeah. They, <laughs> what, is, <laughs> was, what is going on? Anthony Davis. <laughs> I think the Pacers have a good chance of updating, updating of, I can't talk anymore. It's over. All right. Who could beat <laughs> the Nuggets? The Suns, no. Timberwolves, no. Mavericks, no. You don't think Clippers, the Timberwolves, no. you don't, okay, hold on. Let me pause you on the Timberwolves. Because I yeah. think that objectively is a tricky matchup for the Nuggets. Are you just sold that Jokic has seen enough of that? And the last time he played Rudy Gobert last week, did you see that game? I man, I don't know. The thing with the Timberwolves is there if your biggest weakness is decision making on offense, like the playoffs is where decision making gets the spotlight thrown on you and you make some of the most mistakes. And if you're playing against somebody like the Nuggets, whose top guy specializes in not making those kinds of mistakes, that's a scary gambit. And I know like last year we talked about how well how quote unquote well the Timberwolves played the Nuggets. Uh Jokic didn't look right starting the playoffs. I think we both kind of thought he was a little bit injured. He kind of picked up spe- uh steam later on. Um I don't know. I think that's just that's just not a good situation for the Timberwolves to be in. Could the Timberwolves get it to six games? Sure. But I would be genuinely shocked if the Timberwolves beat the Nuggets in the playoffs. Yeah. Just for um, those who missed it, Jokic was 16 of 20 last week, 41 points, <laughs> seven assists in the, in the latest matchup with the Timberwolves. But I, I do think Minnesota plays them well. Mm-hmm. I am with you in that I would definitely lean... 
Denver in that matchup. But so, okay. So you don't even trust it as a possible upset. Any other teams, if we keep going through the teams, the thunder. So one, so that's it. One team to take out the nuggets. Yeah. That's why they're inner circle. If I would have thought somebody could beat the the nuggets, they'd be in the inner circle for me. Right. Here's the other thing. I I think outside of the starting five for the nuggets, I, I do think they're a little bit weaker than last year, right? Like Bruce Brown's not there anymore. Jeff Green's not there anymore. Christian Brown's obviously playing. And outside of that, like Reggie Jackson played like 20 minutes in the playoffs last season. So they're not bringing in as good of a bench. But if you look at the starting five that they have right now, they played 39% of their total playoff minutes together in the playoffs last year. The starting five of the Nuggets played 39% of the total playoff minutes for the Nuggets. And they were like plus 7.6 or something like that. That's a strong starting lineup. Like the more that you can ride those starters out there, uh, the better I'm just going to feel about them, right? And I think that's enough in this Western Conference to propel you to just being better than than everyone else. How would you feel if, if we get OKC Denver, which one thing we know, we don't know much about this stinking bracket, Cody, but one thing we know, OKC and Denver can only meet in the conference finals. If mm-hmm. they meet in the conference finals, how are you feeling about the Kentucky on Kentucky violence of Shea Gildas Alexander and Jamal Murray? Does that does that change the equation for you? Jamal Murray seems to be one of these players that likes to get up. the The better the opponent and the bigger the challenge, the more serious he takes the basketball. I'm going to abstain. Because, here's the thing, the the Thunder have so many questions for me. By that time, well, I've seen at least eight games of getting some data, seeing how they're going to play in the playoffs. At that point, I'll make a proclamation. Sounds good. Right? So, not going to answer that. So, not gonna answer that. sounds good. Okay, so in, in the West, same question to you. What teams do you think could beat the Nuggets? Do you think the Timberwolves could beat the Nuggets? Do you think the Clippers could beat the Nuggets? The Clippers. Okay, is that yeah. it? I could see OKC doing it. Okay. I could see OKC doing it. Yep. I don't really think the other teams have too much of a shot. Um, I mean, I think the Lakers are very good. I think that would be tough for the Lakers. And Minnesota, I, I agree with you on Minnesota. I think when push comes to shove, especially where they wouldn't have home court, so they wouldn't even get game seven at home, I think that would be pretty tough for Minnesota to pull off. So, yeah, I would say those two teams. I, I, I would say OKC – and the Clippers. Who's your champ? I, I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. I think the Celtics are very good at basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the Nuggets are very good at basketball. And um, yes, I'm including Philly and the Clippers as my other teams that could I, I could see winning this tournament with some reasonable percentage of likelihood. And both of those teams have giant injury question marks as we head into the tournament. But that's maybe also why they're... They're there. Anything else you want to say about this playoff bracket? We're gonna we can come back and do another podcast whenever you want. Celtics are my are my pick to win it all. Wow. Just for the record. For the record. Wow. Pretty easily too. I think I think actually by the end of this, we're just gonna look back at the Celtics and be like, wow, yeah, we should have seen this coming. To support us, patreon.com slash thinking basketball. Um, we just had our latest monthly live QA over there. We're gonna have I'm very excited. We're gonna have our playoff stats board queued up starting soon maybe next week you know as the as the data rolls in i always like to see the top performing playoff guys every year as the series unfold patreon.com slash thinking basketball uh otherwise final parting thoughts before we wrap this one how was this this was your first playoff preview yeah that blew my mind i thought i did this podcast with you before but this is the first first time previewing the playoffs um I just need this. We just need to get going with this. We just need to figure this out. I okay. Hot take. I don't like the first week of the NBA playoffs. I don't. It's too much. It's just way too much basketball. Oh, the fire hose. Yeah, it's too much to take it all in. I like it better when we slow down. It's like the conference finals. And there's like one game a night. Like that's that's a little bit better for me. I love all of the good games, but I I just can't keep up with all of it. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Um. All right. Well, thanks for listening to this one as always hope you really enjoyed these playoffs i am incredibly excited about them i hope we addressed every question mark. i mean i guess in summary like what will happen with the heat again what's going to happen with Embiid and nurse and philadelphia um 
what's going to happen with the Bucks and Giannis and Doc Rivers is back in the playoffs again. Will there will there be adjustments? Will there not be? The Knicks team is pretty fascinating from that perspective of like how deep can they go with this setup that they have playing Jalen Brunson ball. It's so many questions, so many questions. I don't know. I'm not even going to do the West. I don't have time. That's it. Thanks for listening, and I hope you're having a great day. 